Good evening, everybody who's logging in from India. Good day to everyone else who's from who's joining us from across the world. Thank you for joining us for yet another live. And today I have with me an, an amazing DEI warrior and HR business leader, Shalini Chopra, uh, who is joining me for the second time on this live. Shalini, welcome. Thank you, Rekha. It's so nice to be coming again and you know talking about something so wonderful and so crucial. Absolutely. So today, Shalini and I are going to be talking about political savviness and leadership and women. And we are not going to be talking about political savviness as uh, as a generic, oh my God, office politics, I hate it. We're not going to be talking about it in that context. And there is a reason to this. Shalini and I have almost two decades of experience each under our belt. And one of the, you know, when we started our careers almost uh, 15, 20 years ago, we were, we went into, we entered workforces and workspaces, which were very, very male centered, uh, which operated on traditional leadership styles. And we were by no means equipped to handle it, but we had to navigate those pathways. And for the longest ever believing that doing my work and being a good team player was good enough was not, you know, it worked for us for some time, but then we realized that if you wanted to cross up the ladder, you needed to know how to navigate a landscape. And that it was at that point that both of us understood the context, the importance of political savviness as a skill, as a leadership skill. And we have, of course, progressed on our journeys. But recently, when Shalini and I were talking, we suddenly realized that this conversation about political savviness was continuing to be about I don't like office politics amongst women. And we both decided that this was a conversation that we needed to have out in the open because we had so much, you know, when we had a conversation about political savvy, about navigating the political landscape at work and why it was so important as a skill for us to recognize it as a skill, we had so much to talk about. And we, of course, decided that we would talk on our lives. So here we are to talk about political savviness and to look at, to, to unpack it, for us to understand it better so that we can look at it differently. We get a different perspective on it so that we are able to understand what are our reservations with it? What is our resistance to it? And what can we actually do to, to navigate this landscape better so we thrive in our careers, whether you're, you know, whether we're running a business, whether you're a consultant, whether you're, you know, working in an office, we have the right to thrive. And knowing how to be politically savvy is a fundamental requirement of thriving in your career. So, Shalini, is there anything you want to add here before we jump no, into No, you have actually set the context so well that I'm ready to just start awesome. this conversation. <laughs> awesome. So, Shalini, you know, when we had a conversation about political savviness, you know, th there was a lot that came up in that conversation for us. Uh, we, you know, we did share a little bit of angst about uh, being caught, you know, our about our perceptions of the politics at work and how we did not like it. And then how we made a shift over to recognizing that this is a skill set. And, you know, it's not personal, it's a skill set and therefore we needed to learn. But just to set, just to, just to give the listeners a bit of uh, context, a little bit of understanding of where you're at. And, I, your, and your perception is very important here because as a diversity, equity and inclusion champion, as somebody who's been an HR business leader, your perspective comes from within the organization. There is a business perspective to it. There's an HR, there's an organizational perspective to it. So I'm very, very interested to know what is your take on pol being political savvy? What does being political savvy mean to you? Okay, uh, so we've spoken about it, you know, off and on. And um, really political savviness and being politically savvy has changed its meaning for me over a period of time as mm -hmm. it would have been for you too right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know the thing is the roots lie in our conditioning from childhood where we, we were brought up you know with the belief that blowing your own trumpet is a bad thing you don't even talk about yourself and that was not even you know gender specific it's like don't blow your own trumpet let mm. the people talk about you right mm. and from there 
to seeing a world where it is so important to actually position yourself talk about at least what you're genuinely doing yes right do not exaggerate do not amplify maybe but at least be open to talking about your achievements or whatever you've accomplished etc mm-hmm. and and the other dimension was that political being political is a bad thing yes yes right so it was almost uh, equated with being unethical mm the dirty politics part of it yeah but the and as one saw and evolved in the real world one saw that it is it can have both connotations based yes. on the intention so political yeah. savviness is a very very critical leadership competence yes skill as you said right mm-hmm. it is what differentiates is when you get into a political game kind of scenario with some hidden agenda and selfish selfish motive or where you can actually compromise on ethics and integrity yeah right so we were only shown one side of you know the soul label absolutely right? and therefore obviously we did not we did not even think that it's a skill that needs to be developed and that's the skill that actually helps you move up the pyramid absolutely right yes. it is a pyramid it's a brutal world and it's a very competitive world and for everybody gender agnostic and for women it's even much more right it is it is so when i said that it has you know meaning itself has changed for me over a period of time i really learned to appreciate how important it yes. is to start learning the skill you yes. don't even talk about it even now in no. any of the leadership development programs political yes. savviness is not mentioned as a competency you know um, it is a combination of so many important skills yeah yeah you know there's something that i you know there's something that i tell because this is a reservation that i come across when i work with women on their personal brand and it's always a question of why do i have to you know this whole concept of it, there's a lack of understanding of what political savviness actually is and you know just to simplify it down this is some this is a reference point that i offer to most of my clients and most of the women i work with being politically savvy is understanding the landscape you're in understanding the underlying dynamics of that landscape understanding that recognizing that a business is here to make profits a business is about money and learning to articulate your value in a business context and i think this is where so many of us you know we get away with good work excellent work but really how much value is my work creating in the business context and yes. am i articulating it so this i just wanted to put that little definition out there because i find it really helps a lot of my uh, you know the women who work with me to think about it in a different way as say this is how i make the business grow this is how i add value to the business yeah yeah and so on that point it's really especially in leadership roles it's about successfully leading your team yes and leading your organization yes right that's what and all of that needs political savviness right absolutely and ultimately because like you mentioned the landscape all of it is you know at the customer side at the board side at the team side all of it is yeah. the landscape right right and you know in any landscape there are power centers the power centers where do the where does a where, where does a power center gets its power from it is from its relevance to the business it is the it is a center that creates value and is articulating this value you know perfectly well in a very in a way that commands influence that at you know that commands attention that is where it is and unless we recognize it and unless we can find stakeholders you know who are aligned with our growth who are in these power centers who have the influence and the interest it's only a matter of time before our good work stop paying paying off pays, uh, stops paying off right so i want to just quickly dive into the mindset that continues to prevail particularly amongst women i mean there's a general perception that office politics is dirty but you know when i talk to men there is an acceptance and saying okay we've got to play the game to get ahead you know we have to be in the rat race but from women i see stiffer resistance i see more articulated resistance and also this question 
if I do good work, isn't that all that matters? Why do I have to be more than my work? Or why do I, why do I have to play games? Why do I have to, uh, you know, people please? Why do I have to be nice to a particular leader? There are more offensive and cruder terms, but I'm not going to use yeah. that in my life. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's always that sense of, I will not compromise, uh, you know, it's, it's being stated as values, but really when I listen to people, I realize that there's a lot of it comes from our conditioning. And I wanted to understand what your take on it. Is it, is it realistic? for a woman who has career ambitions and leadership aspirations to hold on to this resistance? And what do you think is the lies at the root of this resistance? It is a perceived realism, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we try and believe that this mm -hmm. is, you know, one should not be doing it. It's a dirty game, but that's yeah. where the, you know, the challenge is. That mm -hmm. we are conditioned so strongly on this that no, it's a dirty game. Who said mm -hmm. you have see ultimately the mind is designed mm -hmm. in such a way mm -hmm. that you can influence people through what already influences them. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. And okay. it's a scientific method. Okay. Right? So do you so, want to unpack that a little bit more? I'll do that us? over the conversation. So awesome. so once you calibrate now everybody is different yeah right yeah now, now now put this in context one gets influenced by what already influences the person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. identify who are the key stakeholders in different contexts interesting and then calibrate what influences them interesting interesting and then work towards it let me take a very simple example awesome if i know and this is a real <laughs> example. If I know okay. that, uh, okay, my boss starts early in the morning and he likes to sign off and not keep any meetings after like 3, 3.30, signs off from work. And if he is scheduling a meeting at around 3.30 in the afternoon, mm -hmm. I have to find a way to smoothly scuttle that meeting. Mm -hmm. Because I know if it's an important subject I need to discuss and influence and persuade him about, Mm -hmm. It's not a good time mm -hmm. because he is not in the best of his, you know, switched on mode or the best time. This is not the best time to really get his attention. Mm. So what is the good time for him? Mm. That's the, one has to learn to identify that. And that can't be learned sitting just at the desk and working hard. Yes. These are the cues one has to pick up from the environment. Yes. Right, which makes it takes me to the other very interlinked point of networking. Yes. So your question was, is it realistic? No, it's not. Yeah. But we are somewhere in the middle of, you know, calling it realistic, being in a sense of denial, or sometimes, let me put it very crudely, just plain lazy. Hmm. Because what I mentioned, these are, you know, very sensitive skills to pick up and there is no rule book that will teach you yeah yeah you are learning this at every moment if you are committed to learn absolutely absolutely you know it's very interesting that you talk about uh, stakeholders and you gave that example of knowing when to present your case knowing how to present your case uh, and you know it reminds me of a time of one of the one of the instances I would see happening over and over again uh, during my career with a lot of my bosses. You know, I would find and I would observe people work in this particular way. The brain tends to be more relaxed and more open and receptive early in the morning. You know, when the first thing in the morning, unless there's a fire burning, right? And yeah. I would notice that a lot of people at work would slip in their extra requests. You know, I want leave. I want a certain perk. I want a certain privilege. This is what I want. You know, when we do our appraisals, when you promote me, this is what I want. You know, the negotiation that happens yes. to get you what you want. I want this particular office. I want this particular privilege, which is a status symbol in the office. It would happen in the early hours of the day. 
I always notice that. And when you mentioned this, I, you know, it just triggered this memory for me. So it's it's really interesting, you know, and it also boils down to one thing when you said uh, we are just lazy at times. Something that strikes me is a lot of times we walk into the workspace and we treat our workspaces as extensions of our homes and our communities. And we tend to gravitate towards people we like who are not, yeah. not necessarily people who can forward our ambitions or contribute to our ambitions and to whose ambitions we can contribute back to. So we are not very strategic in the way we connect with people, we network with people, or we, uh, you know, we even build human connections and relationships, are we? What do you think about that? You actually have touched a very, very important chord and something which is very close to my heart. And I'm actually discussing with a few people, even the mentors we choose. Yeah. You know, are the kinds we like are more like us. Yes. I was yes. recently doing a mentorship program and of how to match mentors and mentees. And this, I brought this up. It, is, it happens because like in the on the interview table, we end up picking people more like us. Right. Yes. Because we gravitate to it. We like people like ourselves. Yes. Right. And to yes. like people who are not like ourselves, for us, it's a change. We need to yes. put in effort there. It will not happen. Yes. So, you know, unconsciously. Yes. Absolutely. We have to be consciously worked upon. Absolutely. absolutely. And the people who do that are the ones who are then considered very smooth operators. Absolutely. And, you know, I think with women, there's also this whole element of safety because, you know, let's face it, a lot a lot of women don't feel very safe in the workspaces, yep. especially when you go up the ladder. Right. So it is also very normal and natural for us to unconsciously gravitate towards people who are safe for us. And the safest people are the ones who are like us. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I think when it comes to a woman in a workspace, there are many dimensions to the resistance. And I, I mean, you and I have gone through that path, so we know <laughs> what it is like, you know, how we choose to be with safer people without realizing that we're making a choice. And that choice is what supports us, uh, supports our biases and our uh, what we believe in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's one other difference also, Rekha. Yeah, tell uh, me. When men get into a huddle in office, Okay, of course, I'm talking of pre-COVID times. Uh, they could discuss a lot of dynamics playing around in the organization. Yes. Women yeah. don't do that. Even if we are few in number, you know, we do it very rarely, occasionally. I agree. And we, we tend to lose out more that way. Absolutely. We do, and, and we lose out also on uh, sharing that we are a united front. Yes, because uh, like you would, I saw that conversation you are having early in the afternoon today with a gentleman. Yes. The unconscious bias that plays on you know women about political savviness. If a woman is politically savvy, she is yes. good. She is mm -hmm. labeled as a manipulator. Absolutely, you hit while the when a ma while when a male leader is good, he yes. is considered charismatic. Yes, yes, yes. We do right. have double standards. We do have double standards. So unconscious bias or conscious bias plays up there too about, you know, the extra challenges that women have to face on this front. You know, this is such an interesting point you bring up because I know a number of organizations that are now trying to create uh, women's circles, women's interest groups, women's interest circles. Uh, after Cheryl Sandbag, a lot of them call it the lean-in circles. But, you know, in the more traditional industries, they still call the WIGs. And it is incredibly interesting that a WIG or, a, you know, a lean and circle or a, a, when a group of women are intentionally brought together, they have, a, they have the potential to be a powerful force. They have bargaining power. They have, you know, they have the power to come together and make dents in a landscape. And unfortunately, because we don't have this conversation of political savviness, it doesn't happen. It really does not happen. And I still, I mean, because I talk to women's interest groups and again, because it's personal branding and there is this whole element of visibility, the conversation again goes back to, I am not political. I don't want to be political. 
And I have to point out to them that if you are a woman in a workspace, your presence makes you political because there are not enough of us up the lead in the leadership right. pipeline, right? right? So you have to just own it, live with it, and make it work for you with other women. Yes, and in fact, really climb up the steep wall or the you know the mountain till we mm -hmm. have more women. So we need to be even more savvy, actually till the time that shift has happened, right? Absolutely. Actually, so, women, you're right. Women have to be more savvy than is the, you know, required level. Because in the barriers that we are playing against are many more than our male counterparts or colleagues. So. True. Very true. So, Shani, I'm very curious because you're such a vociferous champion for uh, women acquiring or, as you said, learning political savviness. I'm curious about your own journey. I'm pretty sure there is a journey behind this, this conviction that you hold. And I would like to know if you're open to sharing, what was your journey like? Where did it start or at what point did you start recognizing the need to be politically savvy? And how did you go about learning political savviness as a skill? Yeah, it's been interesting. And I have had some of my you know, uh, big setbacks or failures you know, for not being politically savvy. And that's when I realized the importance of it. Like, you know, like many others, many of us, mm -hmm. I also was, when I entered the, you know, working you know, corporate life, it was, I was worse, vociferously speaking that I don't want to be a political person. I want to be far <laughs> from politics. I will never do this. So yeah. it was almost like, it's a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. I was almost positioning myself constantly like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a first time leader and then, you know, a couple of years into it, I realized by observation that the people, the leaders who are mm -hmm. politically smart mm -hmm. and have the right intention are able to lead people better. Yeah. They are able to inspire and keep their teams more motivated, yeah. more engaged, mm. and because of which their teams perform better, yeah. right? And therefore their business performs better. And yeah. obviously then they, they are seen to be performing better as leaders holistically, mm. Mm. right? So people, the teams want to work with them. The management likes them, the board likes them, the customers like them. Yeah. Yeah, that's when I realized that this is really a leadership competency and I have to start learning it. OK, and tell us and more about your journey of actually learning it. So, like I said, uh, Rekha, earlier, uh, political competence savviness is about a combination of behavioral skills. Yeah. Right. And EQ. Mm is one of the prerequisites to it. Yes. Yeah. Starting with self-awareness mm. and you know being aware of one's emotions, managing mm. one's emotions to mm -hmm. understanding what triggers others and mm -hmm. then managing that. Mm. And I would emphasize on the word managing because yeah. many people think, isn't that manipulating? No, it's not manipulating. Yeah. It's really those social emotional skills that need to be learned so that mm -hmm. you're able to communicate in the way the person understands you are able to behave flexibly yeah right yeah yeah sunanda says love what you're saying shalni how political savviness is actually a competency and Pearl's also listening in, and she says, we are not taught to play the game. Doing the work is not enough these days. And see, it's, it's so interesting that we are talking still, we talk about politically savviness. Pearl, you hit the nail on the head. This is a challenge. We think of it still as a game. Yeah. And you know, you know what my child, what, what my, uh, what I find is a problem with the way many of us approach to political savviness is our reactiveness. Our yeah. you know, it's it's something happens, I respond. It is not something that I am in charge of. It is not something I am in control. I'm not in the driver's seat. 
I am, you know, somebody who's at the receiving end and I'm responding and I'm reacting. And that for me is the real challenge with this resistance to political savviness, as you call it, right? So anyway, back to you, Shalini, tell us more about the behavioral skills that you talked about, which goes into political savviness, deconstruct it for us. So like I said, uh, you have to understand what are the you know hot buttons in different people, what mm -hmm. influences different people, mm -hmm. talk in their language, understand mm -hmm. what is a better time to speak to someone, mm -hmm. what is a better way to speak to someone. And for mm -hmm. each of those critical stakeholders, it will be different. Yes. Yes. So work towards understanding that. Mm -hmm. And mm. also, uh, for again, I take an example, when you move in meetings, mm -hmm. you know, which is the seat that you should take? At times, I have actually planned that too. Depending on the role that I want to play in that particular meeting, I have, yeah. you know, designed my presence that I can sit next to the CEO, for instance, or next yeah. to the president, you know, the top guy in the meeting room. That, yeah, because there is something that I want to speak about and want to be heard. Yeah, yeah. Right. Then yeah. calibrating. Suppose you are you know joining new teams or new organizations. You need to silently calibrate the different environments. Yeah. You know different team setting uh, meeting settings. Who speaks first? Who speaks second? How does a person respond to a particular person and another person? All yeah. those calibrations need to be done to start with. And yeah. then you actually become flexible in your responses towards different people based on their choices. And yeah. I want to again emphasize on the fact that this is all done with the intention to make your team succeed, make your unit succeed, make your, make your organization succeed. Yes. In a you smooth know, way. You know, interesting. Uh, one of the things I learned at my workplace over a period of time, you know, when I started realizing that, oh, I have to be politically savvy was, and I think I mentioned to you to track, you know, just like a hunter tracks to track the threads of power within the organization. Yeah. So it's actually to step back and look yeah. at the organization and says, where are the power centers? Who's at the nucleus of these power centers? What are the invisible threads from me? Like they say, there are six degrees of separation. It inevitably, it's the best place you can see this is in, is in an organization. And you yeah. can see the degrees of separation and you can track. And what I would do was not only track, but also look at people, stakeholders who are likely to be interested in my team's work. And therefore, when we articulate our value you know, framework in the context of the business, if somebody has interest in what you're doing, you get a you get a leg up in terms of yeah. being positioned and being strategically positioned right? yeah yeah yep so, so all these sidebar conversations and relationships need to be established yes you know in fact sunanda raises a very interesting point she says i also wonder what baggage the word political has assumed over a period of time so that when it is used what all subtext is triggered can be interesting as data. Breaking the word down is helpful, I guess, just as Shalini is doing. And I think that's very, very true. You know, uh, the word political has come to assume negative connotations. Yeah. It, and it, more it, in the context of women leaders. Again, I want to underline that. <laughs> I agree. You know, one of the things that offends me about women leaders, you know, the terminology and the phrases that is being used about women leaders is this whole queen bee syndrome. Yeah. And I, I don't understand why we would even use words like queen bee in a negative way when an alpha male is a positive. It's a positive. Right. So you can yeah. right there and there see the negative connotations and the biases that kick into place when a woman starts stepping into uh stepping up the ladder up the pyramid of power right yeah absolutely absolutely okay pearl says i like that silently calibrate do you want to elaborate a little more on this silently calibrate because i think that's a very powerful point yeah so you know as part of coaching a lot of leaders on influencing skills this is mm -hmm. one of the very important dimensions that each of them learns how to pick up the non-verbal cues yeah. you know the visual cues 
Mm. And and there is no generic rule or dictionary to it. Everybody has a different normal and a regular way of behaving. So mm. that one has to really learn these skills, and they are very much learnable. Mm. And it starts with really listening through your eyes and ears, and you know, being very patient, and uh, yeah. learning to see the difference that different contexts bring about in people. Yes. Absolutely. You know, I also like the thing, I, you know, I always believe that when you can see, once you see, you cannot unsee it after that. Yeah. And once you, so once you can see the context, once you can see the person as more than just a body doing work, uh, you see that person as a person who can, who has his or her biases, his or her, uh, or their, uh, you know, the way they work, their makeup is so different. You can actually sit down and say, how do I build a meaningful me connection with them? And I think yeah. political savviness really boils down to that, right? Like, how do I build a meaningful connection that creates value for both of us? How do I be honest and truthful in intention and communication with this person? And how do we have those, you know, how do we have those boundaries? How do we, how are we, how are we going forward and building that relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So if I could add an example on yeah. this, for instance, yeah, like please. I come from the HR function and like I say, HR and finance always arguing about things, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. More so when it comes to rewards and, uh, you know, increments and bonuses, etc. Now, in most cases, the CEO ends up getting more influenced by the CFO. Yes. Right? <laughs> right? Because it's hard numbers, it's black and white, all of that, right? And ours is always a softer side, which is, you know, very often difficult to quantify, right? Yes. yes. So, so it ends up, if it's a, three of us in a meeting, it always tears in the other direction. So yes. often having a discussion, getting the CFO on your side mm -hmm. beforehand, and also being aware of what are the things that is, you know, he or she is still not convinced about, right? Picking that up and discussing with the CEO differently, separately, and influencing her so mm. that, you know, you're able to achieve the outcome and the objective that you're setting. Absolutely. So, so all this is political savviness. Rather than saying, no, but I am right, so I will fight it out. No. You don't need to fight it out. You just need to learn how to influence. You know, what I really like, what I really like is the contrast you're now offering between being adversary, adversarial and collaborative. It's really about being collaborative, particularly with people who are different from you so that everybody has an element of win. It, it won't be a complete win for everybody, but you will come to an outcome which is workable for everybody. And at the same time, it's also you being seen as somebody who's a solution provider, somebody yep. who is an ecosystem builder, rather than somebody who's so rooted in their ego, right? Yeah, and I think for organizational success, that is one of the key elements, right? Yep. Because even, even my peers are working towards the organizational goal through their function or through their scope of work. Right. So am I. So yes. why should we see each other as, you know, competitors rather than collaborators? It's Absolutely. just that people see things differently, yes. right? They understand things differently. Mm -hmm. And that is where we need to be flexible in our communication, in our behaviors and, yes. you know, handle it yes. accordingly. And Absolutely. all of that is political savviness. I agree. You know, so one of the things that strikes me is when we are discussing, we are unpacking political savviness. And this is something you and I have spoken about one on one, that when we really unpack it, there are so many behavioral skills. There are so many, uh, you know, the EQ part of it. Or when we talk about the human connection or we talk about trust based networking, these are skills women excel at. These are skills, you know, the softer skills, as we call it. it. These are skills that women are good at. And therefore, there are parts of being political savvy or learning to be polit political savvy, which is really, which is, you know, which is perfect for us. And that's a good starting point for us. But yet, there still is resistance. 
there still is, uh, you know, there still is this, I wouldn't even say it's, it's, a, it's a sense of fear. It's a sense of wariness. It's a sense of belief that I will not be good at it. Yeah, it is. It's a sense of fear. And uh, I think what also adds to it that we don't have enough communities and networks. That's true. It comes down to that. We don't, uh, we don't spend too much time outside our workstations or our laptops mm -hmm. because of time constraints, because of, you know, and because of time constraints, we start falling behind mm -hmm. in that space. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of lose interest. Mm. But it is so important to have these sidebar conversations before yeah. any crucial meeting and otherwise too, because the pulse of the organization, pulse of the whole system is, yeah. you know, understood yeah. through that. And that is what men are usually very good at because in the smoking corners, in the, you know, beer bars, etc., they're used yeah. to just talking yeah. about everything. And I, I remember that even I and a couple of my colleagues actually uh, got into smoking and I used to get into that smoking corner huddle to listen to these conversations, but it did not survive too long because, you know, there are too many labels that get attached to us yeah. and we are not comfortable with that. Many of us are not. Right. You know, that resonates very deeply with me because I didn't smoke, but I would hang out at the smoking corners. Uh, just to listen and understand what's going on in the organization. But I would often join my colleagues for a post-work drink. And what I realized after the second or third time I joined them was they were very intimidated. They were extremely <laughs> intimidated yeah. by the fact there was a single woman who was sitting at that table and drinking with them as much as, you know, I wasn't, I was owning my, owning that time and that space and that intimidated them. And like you said, labels are very easy to collect at such times. And we are not even, sometimes you do, it doesn't even occur to you that you're collecting a label or you're at yeah. risk of being labeled at that point. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing I learned was after I tried it a few times and I realized that I did not want this extra stress, I realized that it was also a matter of fact of finding, as you said, the right time to go and have a conversation. So. I would actually schedule conversations with uh, senior leaders and say, let me just have a chat with you. Let me see what mm. I can do to help you. Let me do. And I would sit down and have a cup of coffee with them, understand what was going on with their business. And this is where, you know, when you have, if you have good listening skills, you can actually build equations that way as well. Right. True. Very true. I agree. And, yeah. and that has worked for you like brilliantly. You shared in the past also. So. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, it has worked at times. There are times when it has not worked. <laughs> but but I the lesson I really learned, Shalini, at that point in time was for me to not give in to my conditioning, which makes me a nurturer. I needed to free up my time at work. You know, one of the things we talk about is I'm so busy at work. But you know, when you really look at all the work you're doing in a day or in that time you're in office, you will also notice that you're spending a lot of your time doing mom duties which is taking care of people listening to people uh take you know and you don't have to do that at work like you don't have to do it beyond the point right you you yeah. are there for yourself as well and you have to be assertive in claiming that for yourself right what do you think about that i'm sure you must have come across that yeah i totally agree with what you're saying we tend to you know uh kind of get over nurturing sometimes Mm. in our roles even professionally and i think that's the natural instinct that comes through and we have to consciously learn to draw the line and absolutely not do that well. absolutely yeah. so i'm going to i'm going to uh, you know go to the next question because i'm very curious to know your take on this how easy do you think it is for a woman who wants to learn to learn to be politically savvy in their work and at what stage do you start? Like, these are not skills we are taught in schools. These are not skills we are taught before we enter the workspace. And it's, for, you know, with you and me, we figured out that we went through a period of time before we learned, oh, we needed to be politically savvy. So what stage do you think we should really start the learning process? And how easy is it? Um, easy, I think it, anything to be learned you need to step out of your comfort zone yeah right 
so mm. i i never look at it as easy or challenging it is that it has to be learned and then find a way best way whether you need a mentor or a coach or maybe a colleague or friend who is good at it try and mm. get some inputs and then you know one step leads to the next right when should one start learning as soon as possible mm. as young as possible mm. because uh, like i still remember in my mba days also we were told that you know it's it's about networking networking and networking but mm. uh, women still don't network enough mm, that's true right right yeah. and while they have the natural instincts and strengths to be good networkers right in fact networking is not the strength they are better collaborators they connect yeah. Yeah. in fact we yeah. don't believe in networking we believe in connecting with people and Absolutely. that's far more advanced than networking right I and agree. and deeper right in mm. impact also mm. so uh one should start as young as one can but mm. also very important is to keep a view of where you want to be 3 years down the line 5 years down yeah. the line and mm. start preparing for those roles right now yeah. in terms of getting those you know behavioral skills as yeah. a natural instinct because it takes time to learn these and Absolutely. then you know become you know moving from conscious incompetence to mm. unconscious competence that journey mm. for any yes. behavior will take time yes absolutely so where do we begin how do you know somebody says i want to start i want to learn these skills how where do they start how can how can they even begin i think focus on eq to start with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just strengthening your emotional quotient is mm -hmm. a very good good space to start at and mm -hmm. uh, what i would also recommend is that in today's world there's so much knowledge floating around yeah right so that is kind of becoming an inhibitor to learning you're right because we think we know everything because it's right there in front of us and on the screens mm. yeah. but we haven't really learned it we haven't yeah. practiced first is you practice then right. you become proficient at it yeah right you start from zero and then you reach the level 5 on a scale of 1 to 5 right? right so but because there's so much hitting us we think you know we know it all but we end up learning hardly anything right right, right. for instance gratitude we mm. talk of gratitude but how many of us feel gratitude it's a True. feeling of gratitude that results in the positive transformation of every human being absolutely absolutely right? similarly empathy yeah right so empathy again the more diverse experiences you expose yourself to your yeah. empathetic skills will get stronger right now this hardly any book talks of her, but experienced leaders will tell you about it yes right and also um search and seek out mentors yeah and and that has to be really a commitment from the learner side because yes. when a, a good mentor is ready to you know impart you share something with you he or she is going to share his entire life experiences and wisdom hmm right yeah. and yeah. in such a simple way to you to the learner absolutely. so that has to be appreciated absolutely i so agree so these are the two three very doable you know ways of approaching yeah this. do you do you have i'm now very curious do you have uh, any daily or regular like you know when you say practice are there any regular tips or tricks that you can offer up if they comes to your mind does anything come to your mind to offer up in terms of daily practice at the workspace when you go in to be more politically savvy start by listening non judgmentally mm oh that's an excellent one so listening and being non judgmental i'm trying to pack that yeah. into one yeah okay yeah and so i think you know, shall i think also something that you and i keep talking about is also being very aware of your own values 
right? Because, you know, sometimes if you are called by the environment you are on to act in a way that contradicts your sense of your values, then maybe that's not the place for you and you need to make a judgment call there. Yes. There right? You know, because political savviness in that sense is not holding on or clinging on or people pleasing or anything. It's also saying this doesn't work for me. Yeah, absolutely. Political savviness in the frame of your own values and ethics. Yeah. 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 I think we need to emphasize and repeat that a little more because we started with that right. conversation. But exactly. it is all in the context of being high on integrity you know, align to one's values. Otherwise, yeah. it will never sustain. Otherwise, it becomes a political game. Exactly. And that's what we don't want. Exactly. Exactly. I love that you have connected that, you know, looped it back to our personal values and our personal purpose and vision uh, so that we know the difference between being savvy and being manipulative. Yeah. 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 And since you mentioned purpose last time also, I think I'd said that, you know, one gets a lot of labels and one has to fight it. But when yeah. one is working and inspired one by one's purpose, one gets yeah. the strength within oneself to fight it. Then the labels yeah. would not matter. Exactly. You know, ultimately, I you know, one thing I learned in my career was people can label me, but that's their burden. The exactly. label is in their head. It's not stuck on me. It is stuck on me the day I agree it is mine to own. But if I don't own it, it's not mine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Rekha, to add to that point where you said that where do they start? I think one of the key steps, step one is or zero, however you want mm. to number it. It's mm. acceptance. It's accepting yeah. the fact that is it is an important competency, political savviness. Yeah. And yeah. that you cannot continue to do well and thrive by just sitting at your desk thinking that, oh, the world is bad, you know, if they are being political. Yes. So accepting yes. that it's a skill to be learned. Yes. And to be practiced within one's, you know, values and integrity framework. Absolutely. I love that. I really love that. So I think we have almost come to the oh end of our conversation. Is there is there anything else you want to drop, you know, any more truth bombs you want to drop in before we wind up for the evening? <laughs> Just learn it one step at a time. Just, you know, focus on listening skills. Ultimately, it's about influencing. And yes. when you learn influencing, you'll see that it's so easy. I mean, this is for the rest of the world. So. I think the one of the most beautiful things about having, you know, working on your EQ, working on, say, listening, working on communication, working on your boundaries, being empathetic, being compassionate. I think one of the most beautiful things of that is it automatically leads to connection. It automatically leads to collaboration. It automatically brings you the visibility you seek. And at the same time, it organically makes you politically savvy in a way you enjoy it. Yes, right. because you're being authentic. Absolutely, absolutely. Like you don't have to fake it. Fake you, it. Don't have, exactly. yeah, you don't have to be this person you're not. No. You can be who you are and do it with a lot of grace, uh, provided you don't put labels onto the word political savviness. Yeah. Anyway, I've enjoyed this conversation so much, Alni. Clearly so a lot of people have, have also enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for even bringing this topic up because I think you were the person who called me up and said, I want to talk about this and <laughs> let's do a live about it. So I'm really grateful that you uh, did bring this topic up and we are having this conversation. Thank you so much. And to everybody who has joined in, Sunanda, Pearl, Suparna, thank you. Thank you, thank you thank very, you so very much. much. And thank you, Rekha, for such an interesting conversation, such an engaging one.